So we've already alluded to kind of what long run equilibrium looks like, but uh, the long run equilibrium is the economy in a state where factor prices are no longer adjusting to output gaps. And so remember that it's no longer adjusting if the actual y is equal to the potential y. So we're at this point where the AD curve crosses uh, y star, that vertical y star curve. So sometimes this vertical y star is called like the long run aggregate supply curve, the classic aggregate supply curve. Because long run equilibrium is just the intersection of this AD curve with the y star. So notice that there's no relationship between the price level and potential output. So notice in this first panel, uh, in number one, a rise in aggregate demand. So if there is no change in potential GDP, so Y zero star on this graph, uh, even if there is a shift in the AD curve, notice that this has no effect on potential GDP. The AD curve itself determines the price level in the long run, but the long run GDP is equals the potential GDP. Now looking at the next panel, we can see the only way to change GDP in the long run is to shift this Y star curve to the right. So you want to have this growth in potential output. And so this is where you know economic theories of growth would come in. So we might think of changes in things like factor supplies, if you remember the, the three different states we talked about before. So we could have an increase in the labor supply could possibly shift this Y star to the right or an improvement in technology and things like that could shift this Y star to the right. But we're not going to get a change in long run equilibrium unless we shift this potential GDP, this Y star to the right. So in that last video and early or earlier in this chapter, we talked about when we have expansionary or um, contractionary AD shocks, what happens to in the short run in this adjustment period afterwards. So let's just click on the next slide. Well, one thing that could happen is that, you know, we have an AD or AS shocks that pushes us away from A star, and maybe the economy could be really, really slow to react. And so what we might want to do is have some kind of fiscal policy. And we might even want some fiscal stabilization policy, which is trying to reduce how much volatility we see um, we see in our economy. So what I mean by that, we can kind of go back to this picture as let's draw kind of two pictures that look similar, but one's more volatile. So for instance, here are two different economies. We have time on the X axis and real Y on the Y for both of them. We have this potential GDP going up. And so, in an economy which is unstable, we might have big peaks and troughs of our business cycle. Well, this is probably going to cause the economy to go really, to be doing really, really well sometimes, then really, really terrible other times. We probably prefer to have some kind of policies that stop these big peaks and troughs. So instead, we kind of want to limit the peaks and troughs in our economy. So we're kind of stable around this Y star. So remember, this straighter line is Y star, and the curvy line is the actual Y. That's the business cycles. It's the actual Y bumping around this potential uh, actual Y. Hopefully, you can still see that on the screen. Um, and so we really prefer this economy on the right, we want it to be relatively stable. That says actual, I know it's really hard to read. Um, and so what fiscal stabilization policy is, is it tries to get an economy that looks a little bit more like this right economy than this left of less uh, left economy here. So when we have this AD or AS shock that pushes us to a short run equilibrium away from Y star, there's three things that um, that could take place. The first is that we could use uh, fiscal stabilization policy. The second is that we, we could wait for the recovery of the private sector demand. Um, so for instance, if there's a contractionary AD shock, we could wait for the private demand to kick back in and that would cause a shift in the AD curve. 
or the third one is what we've already seen happen, which is this adjustment process. And that's that shift in the AS curve. So now we're going to talk about these first two, and particularly number one of this list of three things. So let's go to the next slide. So here's the basic theory of stabilization, of fiscal stabilization. So both these graphs on the left and the right are supposed to have the exact same thing. We've had some kind of um, recessionary gap open up. So here Y0, the actual Y is less than potential. So we have some kind of recessionary gap. We can think of two different ways to close this gap. The first way is that way we saw before, where we have this uh, gap closed by the fact there's downward pressure on wages and other factors, and that's going to slowly shift this AS curve to the right, which is going to slowly get us back to this Y star. The other possibility is this fiscal stabilization policy, and that's why we have this recessionary, recessionary gap, and we respond to this recessionary gap by increasing, um, for instance, our government purchases or kind of changing our tax system or something like that. Government purchases are the most obvious thing to think about. So here's that natural um, process, adjustment process that's gonna happen if we don't do anything to the economy. We're gonna see this AS curve slowly shift to the right as there's downward pressure on wages. So input prices are going down, so the AS curve will slowly shift to the right, and it's going to shift until we're back at this long-run equilibrium down here. So we have a lower price level, and we're right back to Y star. On the other hand, what you could do is have fiscal stabilization policy, which let's say, for instance, we increase our government purchases. So big G goes up, that's going to cause big A, capital A, to go up in our AE, uh, model, which is going to cause our rightward shift of our AD curve by the simple multiplier times that change in uh, G. And so this is going to cause our rightward shift of our AD curve, which has upward pressure on prices, and it's going to get us back to equilibrium. Maybe you want to do this because we'll get back to equilibrium really fast. Whereas the wages we know are really slow to adjust in this left-hand side one. So maybe this right-hand one is a better way to get us back to equilibrium in a faster way. We can think of the same thing with the inflationary gap. Again, the left-hand side is like the natural way the economy will adjust. On the right-hand side, we can think of how fiscal policy could use to close this gap perhaps a bit uh, faster. So naturally what will happen in this left-hand side graph is that there's going to be upward pressure on wages. We have this inflationary output gap, Y0, where Y is greater than Y star. There's upward pressure on wages. That means this AS curve will slowly shift to the left, maybe a bit faster than the downward pressure on wages. But it's going to shift to the left, this AS curve, and we're going to have upward pressure on prices. So here P0 goes up to P1, and we're back at Y star. The other option, if we have this inflationary gap, is to shift our AD curve instead. And one way to shift this AT curve that we've learned about is through fiscal policy. And here we'd be reducing, for instance, government purchases. So we're reducing government purchases which is shifting capital A down in our AE model, or market, the demand side of the economy, which is causing a leftward shift of the AD curve by that simple multiplier times that change in G. And so a leftward shift in the AD curve is going to bring us to an equilibrium with a lower price level, but we're back at Y star. So notice that we're going to be back at Y star no matter what. All that's changing is um, whether the price level goes up or down if we use fiscal policy or let this um, let the adjustment period happen or let the adjustment process happen by itself. So it's going to be key here and whether we want to use fiscal policy or not is probably the speed at which this happens and the precision we can use in our fiscal policy. So this model has a certain paradox in it, and this is the paradox of thrift that the book mentions. Um, 
So think of it this way. In the short run, we could increase our savings, and this is going to lead to a reduction in GDP because our savings rates is going up or we're saving more money. But if we save more money, we actually reduce GDP because our consumption goes down. And if we're saving just a proportion of GDP, that could actually mean that our aggregate saving doesn't change. So this is kind of a paradox. In the long run, it's not going to have this paradox of thrift. In the long run, we want to have an increased desired savings. It's going to have a decrease in the price level. We're going to have an increase in investment. And a lot of times we think this is what's going to lead to the aggregate output uh, actually increasing or Y star increasing over time. So the final thing that we're going to talk about is this idea of discretionary versus automatic fiscal policy. So discretionary fiscal policy or stabilization policy is when the government actively changes either their purchases through that capital G or their taxes through capital T or in this, you know, in the model we've looked at so far, there's only that little T, that marginal tax rate or that uh, constant tax rate. And they're going to use these to kind of steer real GDP and get it back to the potential Y star. So that's a discretionary fiscal policy. But there's also like built in fiscal policy that can cause this automatic stabilization of your economy. We can design our tax system um, to keep our economy, our economy relatively stable. So notice the tax system is I mean, almost an automatic stabilizer by itself. So notice that when Y changes, taxes and transfers both change. So when Y is very high, the amount of taxes we're bringing in is relatively large because we're taking a proportion of um, GDP in our taxes, right? Our little tax, our little T or our tax rate is like 10 or 20%. The greater the Y is, the greater the little T times the Y is. So also notice the higher the tax rate, the smaller the simple multiplier is. And the smaller the simple multiplier is, the smaller the, sh the shifts in the AD curve is in response to these aggregate demand shocks. So a, a large tax rate is going to make our AE curve relatively flat, which means our a D curve is relatively vertical and it shifts around only a little bit from changes in uh, capital A. Whereas if we have a really low tax rate, we have a relatively flat A D curve and small changes in capital A are really going to push our A D curve around a lot, which is going to have a really unstable economy. So the automatic stabilizers are related to the slope of the AE curve, which is related to the slope of the AD curve. So here we know that Z is the slope of the AE curve. And so anything that makes Z small is going to make our simple multiplier small and our economy more stable. So a higher tax rate, the higher little t, the smaller that Z is. The lower the marginal propensity to consume, the smaller the Z is. The higher the marginal propensity to import, the smaller the Z is. So these are different factors that can make our economy more stable. And a lot of times we think of having uh, a relatively high tax rate as an automatic stabilizer in our economy. Our economy gets shifted around and pushed around less from shocks to our AD curve. So it seems like fiscal policy is kind of this magical thing that if we're ever, um, our economy is ever adjusting really slowly, we should use fiscal policy and push us out of this um, kind of trough of our business cycle and back to Y star. And while, you know, most economists are going to think that automatic fiscal stabilizers are, are really going to be good and we should have them in our economy, some economists are less kind of um, enthusiastic about this discretionary fiscal policy. And this is what we see taking place right now in our economy due to COVID. So we're, we're seeing this large fiscal response, government's sending out checks, you've got to make sure people have money and things like that. 
but there's limitations and we see these limitations being uh, discussed in the news every day here in Canada. There's long and uncertain legs. So how do we get this money out to people as fast as possible? How do we know when they're going to start to spend it? How long is that going to take? That's a leg. Is that going to be next month that we can get money to them? Is that going to be next week? How long is it going to take? That's the first limitation of this discretionary fiscal policy. The second limitation is this temporary versus permanent changes in policy. So for instance, now we've seen this COVID emergency benefit program, $2,000 a month for four months. So that's the Canadian kind of response or one of the Canadian's fiscal responses to this. In the States, you see that they're sending out checks or some of their um, their more, more recent kind of bill that got passed is kind of sending, I think it's $1,200 checks per person or something like that. Not exactly clear on the details, but it's not clear if this is a temporary or permanent change. And how do we uh, make sure it's a temporary change until we get through this crisis? Or is this going to end up being like a permanent part of our policy? And the last limitation is going to be the impossibility of fine tuning. And this is another thing that's really been debated right now in response to this, this crisis that we're dealing with, is how much fiscal policy do we need? And how hard it is to kind of fi fine tune and know exactly how much we need. That's about fine tuning. We don't know if how much we need to change our fiscal policy to push us back to Y star. It's not clear how much that is. Um, so that's kind of some of the debates we're seeing played out in the news right now in response to COVID. Now this is COVID's a much kind of different uh, kettle of fish than the, than the usual kind of downturn maybe we saw in 20, uh, 2008, um, the Great Recession. So the last kind of slide is just talking about fiscal policy and growth. So we've talked about fiscal stabilization policy, kind of making sure that our economy is relatively stable around uh, Y star. And we can do that through you know, high tax rates, or we, if we had low marginal propensity consumes or high savings rates, this can kind of keep our economy more stable. Now we can also have um, fiscal stabilization policy that's discretionary, like these changes in capital G, and maybe we want to use these changes in capital G to not only increase short run Y, but also increase Y star, which would increase long run Y star. So we might want to do this if we concentrate uh, our government spending on areas that are going to increase uh, productivity in the private sector and things like that. So this is where maybe we want to concentrate our fiscal policy in certain areas to kind of promote growth. So that's kind of sums up this uh, this chapter, the basics of this chapter, though I think doing a couple practice problems will really help kind of understand what's going on. So the first thing we kind of discussed is that we have these different states of the economy. We have a short run equilibrium where AS equals AD. We have an adjustment process when we have these upward or downward pressure on wages um, as a result of us being in a short run equilibrium that's not a long run equilibrium. And then we have this long run equilibrium where AD uh, kind of crosses Y star, which is this potential output. We talked about the automatic process that moves us back to long run equilibrium forever in the short run equilibrium. And we talked about how fiscal policy can use to perhaps speed this process up. And then finally, the last kind of topic we talked about is this idea of automatic built in stabilizers to our economy to make sure we don't have, you know, our peaks aren't too, uh, are too high and our troughs aren't too low. So maybe we want to have these fiscal, automatic fiscal stabilizers that mean our economy is relatively stable over time.